evening, we're actually going into the uh, book that we're reading for our reading the Bible together, uh, Exodus. And uh, if there's any one chapter that we should be aware of in Exodus, it's certainly Exodus chapter 20, where we find uh, the Ten Commandments. What I'd like to do uh, the, this evening is simply read the first three verses of Exodus 20. Um, and we're going to be looking really at verses 2 and 3. 2 gives us the motivation for doing verse 3 and following. So let's uh, first of all read it. Then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing uh, this evening. Now this morning, remember, we began looking at the rules of the race. Remember the race that we saw last week that our Lord calls us to run through the author to the Hebrews. We saw, first of all, this is this morning, that they are the same rules, the same laws that God actually gave to his people in the old covenant when he brought them out of Egypt at least with regard to morality. Uh, the Ten Commandments, those commandments that were written on stone. Remember, Israel, he gave them to Israel. Israel failed to keep those commandments and that of course brought about the necessity of the new covenant. In the new covenant, the Lord actually takes those laws and writes them upon our hearts giving us the desire, which is what we saw secondly. God fixed the obedience problem in the new covenant. He put his laws in our minds and he wrote them on our hearts. He gave us his Holy Spirit so that we might follow Jesus' example, that we might experience the life of Christ within us, that God might fulfill, as we saw, as Paul reminded us in Romans chapter 8, the, the purpose or the reason why God actually chose us in the first place. And the reason why he called us, the reason why he chose us and predestined us is that his son might be the firstborn among many brethren who have his heart, uh, who share his nature, who are like him. Like him, we, well, in a certain sense like him, we don't obey the law of God in the new covenant because we think by doing so that we're going to earn our salvation or justification. Jesus actually did keep the law for that purpose, but he did it because he loved the Father and because he loved us. Uh, we don't live under a legal covenant. We don't look at the law of God as, as basically a, a system of works that we do in order to save ourselves, to justify ourselves before God. In the new covenant, we keep the law of God because that is what we want to do because the Lord has changed our hearts by his Holy Spirit, he's written his law on them. And finally, we saw that since the love he gives us through the Spirit of God is what leads us to obedience, we saw that it's our obedience and not merely the love that we feel in our hearts that is the true measure of our love for the Lord. The more we obey him, the more we love him. And again, we're not excluding the idea that we should love him in our affections, in our hearts. We should. But if that's all the further it gets, then we're not loving him as he calls us to love him. And our love is not as strong as he calls it to be and as he is willing to make it if we will simply look to him in faith. Now again, the reason why we're looking at this is because we're seeking to understand why it is that Knox and Bunyan and Newton and Spurgeon and Little were able to do what they did and able to do as much as they did. The reason is because they had this change of heart. They had God's law written on their hearts. Their affections were stirred up by the Spirit's work. It's because he gave them the desire to please God above all things because he gave them this love. Jesus tells us that the requirement of the whole law, of everything that the Bible teaches, the law and the prophets, at least with regard to the Old Testament, which we know is full of laws, 
that they can all be summarized by these two things. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is what the Lord desires, and that's what He gives in the New Covenant. I was talking with Donna about this earlier. She said she actually heard a sermon by Alistair Begg where he was dealing with exactly the same issue. And he pointed out something which we ought to consider, that this is what God originally intended for man to do when he created him. This was the standard, the same commandments that Jesus actually kept, which were the ones that he had given to his people through Moses, and those which he now gives us the power to do in the new covenant. We put that together with what we've been looking at on Wednesday evenings, that the whole work of redemption is basically to bring about a reversal of what sin brought into the world on the creation and upon man, God is reversing it and bringing it back to the condition that it was in the garden, only we might say better, which means that as he originally intended Adam to obey him, and he did at least for a short time, he is bringing us to the point where we will do exactly the same thing from the heart to love and serve uh, the Lord. But now, in a certain sense, having the Spirit of God isn't enough, at least by itself, in order to accomplish what it is that the Lord seeks to do. The Spirit of God gives us the desire, but we do have to recognize He doesn't give us the content, uh, as it were. We need to look at the law. We need to understand what God has told us to do. And what I mean by that is he doesn't communicate information immediately to our minds. He is the author of the scriptures. But we need to go to the scriptures to see what it is that the Lord would have us to do. That's why the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. I only bring that up because of this. We might think having the Spirit is enough. I've, I've been in circles in the past, maybe you have as well, where they believe that the Spirit of God is enough. All you have to do is go with the flow of, of the Spirit of God as he, as he leads you. And it, what it usually boils down to is this. If you feel like it, do it. But how do we know what we feel like doing is really what the Lord wants us to do? How do we know that's a communication from the Holy Spirit? Well, the only way we can know is by reading the Word of God and comparing what we want to do with what God says we should actually do. The Spirit of God provides the love for that standard, but the law provides the content of that standard. The Spirit of God works through the Word in order to instruct us in the ways of the Lord, to show us in this race what it is we are to lay aside and what it is we are called to do in this race that he's called us to run. Now again, with this in mind, we're going to look at the commandments and try to come to a better understanding of how it is God wants us to live, how he wants us to love him. Now we're not going to look at all the commandments tonight. We are going to look just at one. And we're going to begin at the beginning with the first commandment. And basically what I want us to see here are two things. First of all, that it's been rightly pointed out that God originally gave his law to a people who were motivated by love to serve God. Now, I'm, what I mean by that is not that they necessarily loved him, but the love is God's love. They're motivated or should have been motivated by his love and his mercy to them. And secondly, that God calls us in light of that love to put him first, to love him most of all. Now first let's consider that God gave his law to a redeemed people, a people he redeemed out of Egypt, and it was that redemption that should have been their motivation to love him, serve him. There are at least two reasons why we should love the Lord. There's actually three when you think about it. The first and most important reason we should love the Lord is because he's lovely. The second reason is because he is loving. And the third reason, which we've already dealt with, which is a third reason, is because he has put his love in our hearts, and we should love him because of that. Well, there, these are the two reasons that God's people in the Old Covenant were called to love the Lord, at least the first two we looked at. Notice in our passage, 
Before he tells them what they are to do, he first tells them who he is and what he has done. He says in verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Now he says this first to give them a reason why they should listen to what follows. Now first of all, they should listen because he is the Lord. Now Lord in this sense, though it implies this, is not, doesn't actually mean this. We think of Lord as master, you know, the, the king, the servant, and the Lord is that. But this word here, Lord, is actually his covenant name, the name by which he revealed himself to Israel, Yahweh. In the Hebrew, it is a form of the word to be, and literally it's translated, I am who I am, or I am, I was, I will be. It really refers to God as the one who eternally exists. Now, identifying himself as Yahweh means more than just what his name means, because Yahweh, that name, God, meant something to the people of Israel, and they, they knew what that meant. They knew of this God, the only God. They knew of his perfections, even if most of them were blind, blind to the glory of these perfections. At least they saw them, they understood them, even if they didn't have a heart to appreciate them. By the way, the blessing of the new covenant is God opens our eyes to be able to see the glory of God and the glory of his perfections. Uh, Israel knew that God was the one, Yahweh was the one who created the world. And that the whole universe, which could more easily be seen in those days, I think, than we can see now on earth because of all the lights around us, that that grand you know, galaxy, as it were, that they could see was simply a, a, a huge display of God's infinite presence and his power and his wisdom. We see that in the musings of the psalmist as he contemplates the heavens. We saw that actually this morning in Psalm 19. Uh, Israel knew that God was the eternal one, which is implied in his name, that time had no effect upon him, that he, because he is eternal, because he is outside of time, has really, he never changes. Time has no effect, he never changes. And of course, because he is the creator, and nothing really exists outside of his will, we know that they know that he depended on no one or nothing for his existence, either before or after the creation. They knew of his holiness in particular. That's one thing we see more than just about anything else. In the old covenant is God revealing himself as the one who is holy, which means that he is righteous. He does what is right and good. That, that is what he loves. He loves what is right. And as he communicates to his people, as he communicates to us, that it is the upright who will see his face. And there is no greater blessing than to see the face of God in this life, his face of blessing, and in the world to come, his, again, the beatific vision. They knew that Yahweh was worthy to be loved and adored in the way that he was calling them to, even if they couldn't bring themselves to do it. Now some of them did by his grace. Again, we saw this morning that the old covenant by uh, the author to the Hebrews represents it almost as if nobody in the covenant actually knew him. But we do know there were those, there were few, relatively few, but there were those who actually by his grace looked forward to the Messiah, trusted in him and were saved and they experienced this love that we have in our hearts for the Lord in the new covenant. So they knew who Yahweh was and they knew that he was worthy to be praised, worthy to be loved, worthy to devote their lives to. Well, they knew secondly what he had done for them. They knew of his grace and mercy that he had set apart Abraham and made his covenant with Abraham to send the Messiah through his line who would bring blessing to the entire world that he had chosen him out of a race of fallen men and made his covenant with them and they, that they too were actually experiencing the blessings of that covenant. They knew that because they were Abraham's children that they too were in covenant with him and they knew what he had just done for them. How in his faithfulness to his promise to Abraham he had just delivered them out of Egypt which was no picnic. Out of the iron furnace 
with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm out of the slavery that they had to endure under Pharaoh. God had done that for them. They knew that he had redeemed them to himself, that he had set them free, that they might now serve him uh, in holiness, and that for all these things they should love him. Again, this is what God is expressing as he prepares to give them the commandments. This is why you should keep them. It's because he says, I am the Lord, and because I have brought you out of Egypt. Well, you know, in the New Covenant, God has also shown us things that should endear us to him uh, through the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He has shown us these same things even more clearly in the things that we have experienced. This redemption is, you might say, uh, a much better redemption than the one out of Egypt. He has shown us more about himself what he is like through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came into the world to reveal God to us, to explain him, to show us who he is in terms that we can understand. And what he has revealed about God is something that is glorious, something that is beautiful. Again, not as we usually think of beauty, the physical kind of beauty that people are wrapped up into in our culture, but his moral beauty, his holiness, his, his moral perfection. Jesus showed us that in a life that was a perfect expression of love. He's also given us a clearer demonstration of his love for us, that he's not only lovely, but he is loving to us in sending his son to deliver us from the cruel taskmaster that, that basically kept us in bondage, which was sin and Satan so that we might be set free to enjoy true freedom, freedom from sin, not freedom to sin, but freedom from sin. Freedom from the guilt of sin. We're no longer under the sentence of death and of hell. And freedom, of course, from sin. We no longer have to obey it. Now we can obey God. So there are reasons why we should be ingratiated to the Lord as well and want to do all that he calls us to do. But now with this in mind, the question is how? How do we do that? How do we love God? How should we be willing to give or what should we be willing to give to him in return for his love towards us? Well, what does the first commandment tell us? Uh, it tells us that we should have him as our God, that we should put him first in our hearts and in our affections. That we should love him the way that Jesus said we should love him, the way we read in Deuteronomy chapter six, verses four through six, with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and all of our strength. And of course, since he is our God, <clears throat> that we should put our trust in him alone. Not put our trust in man, not put our trust in riches, not put our trust in certainly any false gods, but in the true God alone. This is really what's wrapped up in this first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Now the only part of this command that seems perhaps a bit unclear is what is meant by the words before me. Because that preposition before in Hebrew, like in English, can mean several different things. The context does narrow it down a bit. <clears throat> but there are still a few options. It can mean before him or in his presence, where God would be telling us that as we live in his presence, we are not to have any other gods, we are not to have any other idols, but we are to have him alone. Obviously, God is everywhere, which means we can't have them at all. I think that goes without saying. Now, do we have idols? Now, that's a question we're going to have to return to in just a moment. It can mean... Also, besides him, you shall have no other gods besides me, in addition to me, or together with me. In other words, God's saying, I'm not going to brook any competition. When it comes to love and devotion, you must love me as God alone. It can also mean beyond him or above him. And by that he means you cannot love anything more than him or trust anything other than him. He must be our God. But now it's kind of an interesting 
question because, or a commandment because the Bible actually tells us there are no other gods but the true God. We know that from what Paul writes to the Corinthians as he's arguing why eating meat sacrificed to an idol really shouldn't be an issue because there are no such things, he says, as idols. 1 Corinthians 8 verses 4 through 6. Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. And one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. So there's really only one true God. There are really no other so-called gods or idols. They really do not exist. So what is the Lord actually telling us in this command? Well, recognizing that there are so-called gods that people believe exist, if we should be worshiping one of these so-called gods, if we've fallen into that particular snare, as the people of God often did, in the Old Covenant, and as many people in the world have today. We obviously need to turn from them and worship and serve Him, the only true God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think that is the most obvious meaning of this commandment. But here's the one that may not be as obvious. He means, second, that we must be fully devoted to Him, and no one and nothing else. Now here's where we can apply that preposition that we were looking at earlier. God says, I will have no competitors. God says there must be nothing that we love more than Him. Anything we love that's on a par with Him or more than Him is an idol and we're guilty of idolatry. Now what is there in this world that we could possibly love more than God? Well, Perhaps we'd be surprised by some of the things we trade our affections to God for. Uh, our possessions obviously can become an idol. We can actually love them and trust them more than we love and trust God. Paul writes to the Colossians in Colossians 3, 5. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed which amounts to idolatry. And I think what he means is the greed in particular amounts to idolatry when your heart is going after things, after possessions. And that's what you're devoted to. That's what you're seeking after. That's what you're placing your hopes of happiness on and your, your trust for the future is on these possessions rather than God. That is idolatry. Now, we often think of the rich young ruler that he was guilty of the particular sin of not loving his neighbor as he should, which is why he was unwilling to sell his possessions and give the proceeds to the poor in order to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The real problem that he had was that his possessions had become his God. They possessed his heart. The thing that he lived for were, was basically those riches he was trusting those riches to, to care for him, and he was not willing to let them go. When something takes hold of your heart like this, when you can't let go of it, to do what the Lord calls you to do, then you have an idol. And that thing, whatever it is, has become your God. It has replaced the true God, and so it has to go. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Well, not just things, but people can also become idols if our love for them becomes greater than our love for God, or if they get in the way of our service to God, as, of course, can love for ourselves. We're also people, and we can also become an idol to ourselves um, if we're not willing to lay down our lives um, for Him. Now that's what Jesus was warning against in this passage in Luke 14, verses 26 through 35. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife 
and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Again, we understand this as saying we can't actually be saved. It's not that we just can't follow the Lord. Be, to be a disciple of Christ, to be a Christian, well, it basically means to be a Christian. It means to trust in the Lord and to be his follower. But we can't follow him if we love one of these things more than we love him, remembering that he is God in human flesh. You shall have no other gods before me. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Again, remember, these are, this, is, this is a very difficult thing to do. You can't do it in your own strength, but if you have the law of God written in your heart, you, you can do this. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000, or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. If you're going to pick up the cross, make sure... You have the willingness to carry it through to the end. So then, none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. And again, that also includes, as we saw earlier in this text, even relations. That doesn't mean, of course, we have to leave everyone and everything and just go somewhere in order to serve the Lord, but it certainly does mean that we see that those things belong to him. He can tell us to let go of them if that's what he wants us to do so that we can go and that we're willing to do that. It also means that we're not going to let any of our relationships get in the way of our doing what the Lord calls us to do. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And again, I think what he means by that is that um, if, if we don't meet these qualifications by his Holy Spirit, if we find that we're not willing to do these things, then we ultimately will be thrown out on the day of judgment because we don't belong to him. Our Lord says, you shall have no other gods before me. No others in his presence, no others beside him, no others above him. He is to be our greatest love, our greatest good, and the one in whom we trust to take care of us, to fulfill our needs. Now we might ask the question, what does this kind of devotion look like? Well, that's what the rest of the commandments actually spell out, particularly the next three. It means, just briefly, and we're going to expand on these over the next several Lord's Days, it means to worship Him as he wants to be worshipped, but not just in his public services, but with our whole lives. I mean, Paul says that offering ourselves up as living sacrifices, that's our reasonable service of worship. So we are to worship him with our whole being. It means to keep our promises to him. When we promise him something, when we vow something, we seek to carry it out, and when we come to the point where we see we've broken those things, we repent, and we renew our desire to serve the Lord. We renew our obedience. It means when we use His name, that we use it meaningfully and reverently. And it also means we don't want to hear when people are going to misuse His name. It means we'll spend an entire day with Him once a week, on the first day of the week, the day he raised his son from the dead. Again, Eric Little and why he didn't run on the Lord's Day. Because the Lord would have us once a week to take a good amount of time, an entire day basically, and spend it with him to renew our love and our devotion uh, to him among his people as we worship together and as we spend the rest of the day. Um, we need to spend it with him. And it means, of course, in the, uh, the last six commandments that we love those around us in the way that the Lord calls us to love him. 
or love them. Now, in a nutshell, it looks like the kind of life that Jesus lived. Jesus kept the commandments, remember. He kept them so that he might give us a perfect righteousness. He kept them so that he might grant to us of his Holy Spirit, but he gave us the Holy Spirit so that we would become like him and that we would be able to do this from the heart again. The, out, the outward change without the inward change is only hypocrisy. That's what the Pharisees were guilty of. God changes the inside so the outside will be changed as well. But again, Jesus also kept these commandments to be an example to us. If you want to know what this looks like, just look at Jesus to see how God wants you to live. Follow his example. That's what Paul did. That's what Peter, James, and John, and all the disciples, minus um, Judas, did. That's what John Knox was doing when he sought to reform Scotland. That's what Bunyan was doing when he was preaching under the threat of prison, or what Newton was doing as he wrote his hymn, Amazing Grace, and preached of the grace of God towards sinners. And of course, Spurgeon, as he preached every Lord's Day the gospel of grace. And this also explains why it was so easy for Eric Little to choose the path that he did because he wanted to follow Jesus' example. He wanted to please God because he loved God. The same will be true for you and for me and for every believer. We will follow Jesus. So the point here is God wants to be first in our hearts. Certainly, that's what he deserves for who he is. That's what he deserves for what he's done for us. That's what we want as he's put the Spirit of God in our hearts. And that's what he actually tells us in the first commandment. So in closing, let me just ask, uh, let me just ask all of us to ask ourselves these particular questions based upon what we've just seen. Just think about your own life, your own experience. Don't raise your hand or say, call out yes or no, okay. But is there anyone or anything that you love more than God? And how would you know, okay? Well, is there anyone or anything that you think about more than Him, that you desire more than Him, that you spend more time with than Him, who takes up your thoughts, takes up your, your basically your attention, and that your heart is directed out, as it were, towards. Now, when I ask that question, is there anybody you spend more time with than God, and we have to remember, how much time are you supposed to spend with God? Not just one day a week, but you're supposed to spend your whole life with Him. How do you do that? Well, you live in the presence of God, always mindful of Him, always seeking to honor Him in everything that you do, so that when you're faced with a choice, any time during the day, your first thought is, how can I honor the Lord? What, what, what should I do that would be pleasing to Him? How can I love Him in this? How can I obey Him in this? You see, we spend all day with Him. And really, there shouldn't be any time, except maybe when we're sleeping, that we're not aware of Him and how we should be pleasing to Him. Is there anyone for whom we would be willing to compromise our obedience to God? Is there anything that we want that He doesn't want us to have or that we would be willing to compromise to have? You see, if something has taken hold of our affections to that degree, it's become elevated above God. So now we have a God above Him. We have something that we are devoted to above Him and we're willing to compromise our relationship to God for that thing or for that person. Now, if we answered yes to any of these questions, then we have an idol, an idol in our lives that we need to let go of or we need to put in its proper place. You know, there are people that we love, but we need to make sure that they are in the proper place. We need to make sure we love God most of all and that we are loving them out of our love for God so that it all flows through our love for Him. Well, Jesus is pointing this evening to that person to that thing, that other love, as he did the rich young ruler. And he says, let go of it and follow me. Well, may the Lord give us the grace to do this. He already has by his spirit in our hearts. He's already given us the power to do this. May he give us 
the grace we need actually to yield and submit to this because this is the good and right path. This is the right thing. This is, this is the only right thing to put God in his place where he should be in our hearts and not have him in second, third, or fourth place. Well, again, may the Lord give us the grace to do this. Uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us, to help us do that.